We are continuing our series in Philippians, and last week we discussed Philippians chapter 1, the beginning section, and in that we discovered a healthy church has a strong partnership in the gospel. It's why the church exists, because of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we continue in chapter 1, we discover that a healthy church has a joy in the advancement of the gospel as the gospel is spread the good news. And we see here Paul's example of one who has a primary uh, vision of proclaiming the gospel. It's what he's about. It's his passion. It's his one thing. It dominates his life. Primary motivation in all of what he does is Christ and the proclamation of Christ. I would like to ask you, what is your primary motivation in life? And obviously, there is a variety of things that we can, that can motivate us, you know, from uh, our job, our family, and what we're trying to do with our life. Um, but it strikes me that in general, people probably have, it boils down to it, probably one motivation, to be happy, or to be content, or and if it's, you know, it really is, can be, to know God. I remember when I was studying acting, uh, in my past life, I studied acting, didn't perform, but I studied, <laughs> uh, such as life, I studied a lot, but, uh, but I actually enjoyed studying. I know that sounds kind of strange, because you would get in a class, and you'd have to study the character that you're playing in a given scene. In every scene, each character has a primary motivation and you're trying to figure out how they're going to get what they want. Acting teacher would always ask, what do you want? What do you want? What are you trying to get in this scene? And also, when you're studying a character, what you really want to discover is, what does that person want in life? What is their primary motivation? And you, what's interesting, that drives all of their life and how they act and how they behave and what they're seeking, their primary motivation. What's interesting, you see somebody's primary motivation in two ways. When they're in conflict, because they're not getting what they want, or also what gives them joy. Those two things, conflict and joy, and we see this in Paul's life here in this circumstance that he's in. And as we said before, Philippians continually repeats the theme on joy, Joy, that word is used 16 times. And he's communicating to the church in Philippi while he's in prison in Rome not to be upset or worried because the gospel is actually advancing and he sees what's happening to him in prison as God's purpose, as God's way of advancing the gospel. He's trying to encourage them because they're thinking, uh-oh, he's in prison, he can't do his ministry. But he's communicating how what has happened to him has really served to advance the gospel. He's had, uh, he's under guard watch, so every four hours somebody comes and sees how he's doing, so he has an opportunity to talk to this person for four hours so they know why he's there. He's there for the gospel. That's why it says the whole palace guard and everyone else knows that he's in chains for Christ. And he also says, because of how he's living, Others have been encouraged to talk about their faith, to share their faith. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced that. If you are a Christian and, you know, it's very difficult, right, in the world, in the job, where you live, in a neighborhood, to talk about your faith. It's just something that either is frowned upon or just doesn't come up that much. You'd rather avoid it. But then you see somebody stand up for their faith, communicate graciously, lovingly about about who God is and who Christ is, and when that happens, that kind of gives you courage to do the same. I remember when I was a freshman in college, and I had become a Christian in high school, and then went to college and partied for a month, honestly, I partied for a month, and then realized, do I really want to do this? <laughs> Let me connect with a Christian fellowship on campus somewhere, see if I can grow the faith that I believe God had planted in me and what happened is the Christian fellowship invited an evangelist. Evangelist would come to town, grab a large crowd in the mall in the center of this public university and preach for about 10 minutes and then have a question and answer. 
And the way he answered questions, the way he took questions that people were asking, the students were asking seriously, and how he responded with love and grace, as well as clarity on the truth, that just emboldened my faith. Not to preach on the mall, wasn't going to do that. But in the classroom, how do I share my faith, talk about my belief in Christ? And I was a philosophy major, so there were many opportunities. Gave me courage to do it. And here, Paul is realizing what is happening to him is giving him courage. Winston Churchill said, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage also is what it takes to sit down and listen. Interesting, that courage to, you're not just ranting and raging, you're not just wanting to always share your opinion, it's courage because of the message you're sharing, but also you're willing to listen, particularly with those who oppose you. And this is where we see Paul in a remarkable way revealing his character, because there's people who are opposing him while he's in prison. He calls it those who are out of envy and rivalry preach Christ. They're opposing Paul. Now, try to explain this briefly. Paul is in prison because of what he has proclaimed. Therefore, others are trying to fill the gap in Rome to preach the gospel. But Paul has written a letter to Rome about how to address the conflict between those who are Jews and have come to faith and those who are Gentiles. And he's saying Christ brought an end to the law in ways of relating to God. And Gentiles need to moderate their behaviors on secondary issues so not to offend Jewish believers. Now, if you do happen to read the New Testament, read in Paul's letters, you find a group called the Judaizers who are going into Paul's churches that he has planted, winning people over and saying, hey, they don't believe, Paul treats preached incorrectly, come follow us. Basically, they're stealing sheep. And Paul in chapter 3 calls them dogs, evildoers, and mutilators of the flesh. It's not fond comments about those who are stealing sheep. Here, it's a group of people who are preaching the gospel to those who don't believe, even though they're trying to get attention for themselves and drawing away from Paul and saying, don't listen to Paul, listen to us, but they're still preaching the gospel. What does Paul say? He commends them because the gospel is preached. He's not having an envy or rivalrous attitude towards these people. Makes me think of a story I heard about two great English evangelists, John Wesley and George Whitfield. They both, they disagreed significantly on doctrinal issues, but both very successful, had thousands upon thousands involved in their ministry, seeing many people come to Christ. And somebody asked George, uh, John Wesley reportedly asked him, if he expected to see Whitfield in heaven, because <laughs> their differences were so great. He said, no, I don't. And you don't think Whitfield's a converted man? So the question goes, Wesley says, of course he's a converted man. But I don't expect to see him in heaven because he will be so close to the throne of God and I will be so far away, I will not be able to see him. A gracious view for those who disagree with us and differ to us, but yet we know no God. Not demonizing people that we disagree with and insisting our own opinions, but realizing that because of who they are and they know God, that they possibly could be closer to God, even though you might disagree. This is Paul's example of humility, because he thinks, what, what does it matter? Christ is preached. It's not, the gospel is bigger than him. He doesn't have an agenda. Think about it. The man who wrote most of the New Testament, a significant portion, realizes it's all of God. It's not about him. His influence on Christianity in many ways is incalculable, but he realizes it's of God. He doesn't take offense personally. That they're preaching and mocking Paul because he's in prison, and he commends the message they're preaching as far as preaching the gospel. Don't take things personally. He sees himself as a slave to Christ. Success of the gospel is more important than his own success. Do you want to win more than you want the gospel to win? That's the question. You know, there was a story of a very gifted volunteer worship leader who led worship at a very small church for about 10 years. 
and he felt called to raise up worship leaders. And as he was raising up worship leaders, he realized there was somebody much more gifted than he was and didn't have an opportunity to lead. So he stepped down and allowed this other person to step up. He had a vision of the gospel that was bigger than his own agenda or preference. And that's where contentment comes in humility. You know, contentment happens when godly ambition overrides selfish ambition. You see everything in a bigger picture. And this is why, this is so important today for Christians in dealing with all the issues going on in the world and personal things, I suppose, which uh, somebody said that Paul's theological convictions lead to both to his theological narrowness on one hand and his large hardness within those convictions on another. What that means is some people think, oh, if you really believe the Bible, then you're going to be narrow, you're going to be judgmental, you're going to be critical, you're going to not be able to relate with others. You've got to be more open and understand all the views in the world and embrace always. But it's not necessarily the case. The more you believe that the Bible is the word of God, Jesus is the son of God, and he is the only way to salvation, when you have those strong convictions of what some would say a narrow way, you could be like Paul and actually have a large heartedness with those convictions to love and grace in the way that Christ did. Because you're drawing from Christ and his power, which, which we will see. And it's the gospel that's more important than necessarily you or your own given agenda. And I think sometimes Christians struggle with this because there's so many ways in society that we can maybe feel offended and sometimes rightly so. But I think sometimes we miss opportunities. There's a story in Dallas a while back, December 2010, where there was a group called Dallas-Fort Worth Coalition of Reason, which is a group of secularists, atheists, and agnostics, got together to put advertisements on the Fort Worth buses that said, millions of Americans are good without God. It's their opinion, but, you know, Christians responded with outrage. They said the ads are hurtful to people who do believe in God, and a comment was, I believe proudly in Jesus Christ. And then Fort Worth pastors got together to boycott public transportation. You know, all this boycott and cancel culture. So the Transportation Authority voted down all advertisements, whether it's secular or sacred, to be displayed. And both sides rejoiced, actually. But I think Christians missed an opportunity and somebody put it this way, are Christians so insecure that we feel a, fear a weakly worded advertisement on a public bus? It was more offense versus an opportunity to proclaim the truth, having a big view of God, holding the view that it's, you don't have to take it personally, but you use it as an opportunity for the gospel and for others. And this is how Paul was able to operate. How was he able to do this? Because he says in verse 19 and 20, through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Trusting, and that's why the song that was sung about being a child of God, believing that God has you, he loves you, he's got your back, he's for you. And then in the midst of praying and having other people pray for you, you were supplied with the courage you need. I think of all those heading off to college, right? Needing courage in all of what you're facing and experiencing and everything new and new relationships and friendships, but also your spiritual life and what that is going to look like. That people would be praying for you and giving you courage to understand God's purposes for your life. And this is what Paul says. To live as Christ, to die is gain. To live as Christ, to die is gain. Nothing can get him down. Nothing can lose his joy because he has God's economy in his thinking. To live, if he continues to live, he could be doing fruitful labor for the kingdom. And if he dies, he gets to be with Christ. This is what's so countercultural to our thinking. In many ways, he is completely free because he's a slave to Christ. <laughs> Think about that. He's completely free because he's a slave. Because he has the right master, the master who loves him and has called 
for him to live a fruitful life. Do you want to live a fruitful life? I believe all of us are in a context where if we seek Christ, if we know Christ and seek him, there's fruit that he wants us to bear, meaning there's influence he wants us to have. From the world's perspective, it might be small ways, but for us, that's why we're here. Do you know why we're here, where we can have influence? And that's why I think some people think the Christian life can be boring, but actually I think it's the most exciting. You know, that's where it's hard, where the, my kids come to me, I'm bored. <laughs> I'm bored. Just got up five minutes ago. What do you want? <laughs> what? I'm bored. Like we have to entertain. Can you really be bored to death? Do you know there was a published article by International Journal of Epidemio oh, Epidemiology. I think I got that right in April. <laughs> that says it is possibly actually to be bored such that you're likely to die early. Interesting. Someone who's bored may not be motivated to eat, exercise, or have a heart healthy lifestyle make them susceptible to cardiovascular events. So says this associate professor from Harvard. And he goes on to say it's possible when people are bored, dangerous hormones are released in the body that stress the heart. Boredom is the greatest symptom of a life without purpose, meaning, and spiritual motivation. Think about that. People that are here that don't know why they're here, why they're living. And this is from John Paul Sartre, the uh, French as existential philosopher. He said, everything has been figured out except how to live. Right? Do you know it's happening? We could send, there's a commercial space travel. You can go into space. You don't need to be an astronaut, but you need to have like a quarter of a million dollars to spend on it <laughs> if you're interested. And I guess another is charging a million or more. You, we all can go into space if we want. It's incredible. Commercial space. There's also self-driving cars. And there's also a robot I saw this week that can cook your dinner and do the dishes. How awesome is that? The robot arm just does all the cooking and does all the cleaning. Look forward to the future on that, but it exists now for those who are wealthy, I suppose. All that we've figured out. But we don't know why, why we're here and why it matters. We, we, we figure out all this other stuff, but why am I here? Why am I living? What is my purpose? And this is where Paul is clear. To live is Christ, to die is gain. It's better to part and be with Christ. That's better by far, but he knows there's fruitful ministry for him. More than the self-gratification that dominates our culture, or leisure, or wealth, or work, or relationships, and all those are good things. But what's the main thing for you? What is the main thing? Because that dominates all those different areas that I just mentioned. What is it? For Paul, it's Christ and the progress for others in faith and how they are progressing. Now, this is where it's hard. When you read this and Paul is an example for us, you could say, okay, great. <laughs> I'm not an apostle, I'm not a missionary, I'm not preaching 24-7, God hasn't called me to that. I have a job, have a family, and I'm called to love and serve them, enjoy them. How does all of that fit into what it means to follow Christ? Well, I just look at a couple of things here that I think are helpful for us when we see the model that Paul has laid out as an example for us as well as what it would mean for us to live a joyful Christian life. One is grow in humility. Grow in humility. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's, it's about the gospel in God and other people. Jeremiah 9 says, Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have an understanding to know me, that I am the Lord, who exercises kindness, judge, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight. What a wonderful thing to know the Lord, more than riches, more than your own wisdom, more than your own strength, to understand the one who is kind and just. Grow in humility, grow in knowledge of God. And the other thing is, don't let opposition steal your joy. 
You know, sometimes all it takes, right, your day is going along fine and somebody has a negative comment and may not be necessarily directed towards you, but it makes you think of things. And, or maybe you might actually have somebody who's really opposing you for whatever reason. So you don't have to let that steal your joy because, you know, in Christ you have all you need. You have his spirit that will give you supply for what you need then. And he will vindicate you as you follow him. You don't need fight battles that he hasn't called you to fight. Don't let opposition steal your joy. And be willing to appear to lose in order to win. Appear to lose. Paul can maybe look a little weak, like, oh, it's great they're preaching, even though I know they're against me, but they're preaching Christ. It appears to be a little bit more submissive. And if you want to go to that, you could say Christ looks like he's losing, right? Going to the cross, not defending himself. It looks like he is lost. He's being whipped, scourged, going to the cross. All is lost. The disciples have left. He knows why he's going to the cross. Sacrificial death for us to redeem us of our sins so that we can be like him. Be willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. And then the last one, the joy in bearing fruit. Joy in having influence over others for his sake. There's nothing, no greater joy than if you experience God's love in your life, in your heart. You know he loves you. To be able to talk to that and to, to mention that to somebody else and it clicks for them. God works in their life and they experience great joy that they're now, their life up until then is going to completely change because they, knew, they know that the Lord of heaven is now for them and loves them. What a joy to be able to express that to somebody else. Our joy comes from seeing others experience his joy. So a healthy church has joy in the advancement of the gospel. Joy because of what we have first experienced first and are not rattled or worried by opposition or challenges because we know the Lord is for us. Let's pray. Father, pray for anyone here who maybe might be, might be new to all of this. Um, pray that your love and what you have done for them would pierce their heart. Pray that by your spirit, in your word, that they would uh, come to a knowledge of you and understand your grace and mercy for them, that all is forgiven because of your grace and that you have a wonderful plan for them in the future, and that you would call them as your own, Lord, call out those who are your children to come to you. Lord, in all of us that have, pray that we can align ourselves more to your will, to your way, in your purposes, and give us the joy of seeing others come to faith, as they experience your joy. In Jesus' name, amen.